Lawrence was majoring in mechanical engineering. He ended up doing poorly in this area because he had fallen in with a Bulgarian professor named John Vincent Adonasov and his graduate student, Clifford Berry, who were building a machine that was intended to automate the solution of some especially tedious differential equations. The basic problem for Lawrence was that he was lazy. He had figured out that everything was much simpler if, like Superman with his X-ray vision, you just stared through the cosmetic distractions and saw the underlying mathematical skeleton. Once you found the math in a thing, you knew everything about it, and you could manipulate it to your heart's content with nothing more than a pencil and a napkin. He saw it in the curve of the silver bars on his glockenspiel, saw it in the catenary arch of a bridge, and in the capacitor-studded drum of Ananasov and Barry's computing machine. Actually pounding on the glockenspiel, riveting the bridge together, or trying to figure out why the computing machine wasn't working were not as interesting to him. Consequently, he got poor grades. From time to time, though, he would perform some stunt on the blackboard that would leave his professor weak in the knees and the other students baffled and hostile. Word got around. At the same time, his grandmother, Blanche, was invoking her extensive congregational connections, working the angles on Lawrence's behalf, totally unbeknownst to him. Her efforts culminated in triumph when Lawrence was awarded an obscure scholarship, endowed by a St. Paul oat processing heir, whose purpose was to send Midwestern Congregationalists to the Ivy League for one year, which, evidently, was deemed a long enough period of time to raise their IQs by a few crucial points, but not long enough to debauch them. So Lawrence got to be a sophomore in Princeton. Now, Princeton was an august school, and going there was a great honor, but no one got around to mentioning either of these facts to Lawrence, who had no way of knowing. This had bad and good consequences. He accepted the scholarship with a faintness of gratitude that infuriated the oat lord, on the other hand, he adjusted to Princeton easily because it was just another place. It reminded him of the nicer bits of Virginia, and there were some nice pipe organs in town, though he was not all that happy with his engineering homework of bridge designing and sprocket cutting problems. As always, these eventually came down to math, most of which he could handle easily. From time to time, he would get stuck, though, which led him to the fine hall, the headquarters of the math department. There was a motley assortment of fellows wandering around in Fine Hall, many sporting British or European accents. Administratively speaking, many of these fellows were not members of the math department at all, but a separate thing called IAS, which stood for Institute for Advanced Something or Other. But they were all in the same building, and they all knew a thing or two about math, so the distinction didn't exist for Lawrence. Quite a few of these men would pretend shyness when Lawrence sought their advice, but others were at least willing to hear him out. For example, he had come up with a way to solve a difficult sprocket tooth shape problem that, as normally solved by engineers, would require any number of perfectly reasonable but aesthetically displeasing approximations. Lawrence's solution would provide exact results. The only drawback was that it would require a quintillion slide rule operators a quintillion years to solve. Lawrence was working on a radically different approach that, if it worked, would bring those figures down to a trillion and a trillion, respectively. Unfortunately, Lawrence was unable to interest anyone at Fine Hall in anything as prosaic as gears, until all of a sudden he made friends with an energetic British fellow whose name he promptly forgot— but who had been doing a lot of literal sprocket-making himself lately. This fellow was trying to build, of all things, a mechanical calculating machine, specifically a machine to calculate certain values of the Riemann zeta function. Lawrence found this to be no more and no less interesting than any other math problem until his new friend assured him that it was frightfully important and that some of the best mathematicians in the world had been gnawing on it for decades. The two of them ended up staying awake until three in the morning working out the solution to Lawrence's sprocket problem. Lawrence presented the results proudly to his engineering professor, who snidely rejected it on grounds of practicality and gave him a poor grade for his troubles. Lawrence finally remembered, after several more contacts, that the name of the friendly Brit was Al something or other. 
Because Al was a passionate cyclist, he and Al went on quite a few bicycle rides through the countryside of the Garden State. As they rode around New Jersey, they talked about math, and particularly about machines for taking the dull part of math off their hands. But Al had been thinking about this subject for longer than Lawrence, and had figured out that computing machines were much more than just labor-saving devices. He'd been working on a radically different sort of computing mechanism that would work out any arithmetic problem whatsoever, as long as you knew how to write the problem down. From a pure logic standpoint, he had already figured out everything there was to know about this as yet hypothetical machine, though he had yet to build one. Lawrence gathered that actually building machinery was looked on as undignified at Cambridge, England, that is, where this Al character was based, or for that matter, at Fine Hall. Al was thrilled to have found in Lawrence someone who did not share this view. Al delicately asked him one day if Lawrence would terribly mind calling him by his full and proper name, which was Alan and not Al. Lawrence apologized and said he would try very hard to keep it in mind. One day, a couple of weeks later, as the two of them sat by a running stream in the woods above the Delaware Water Gap, Alan made some kind of an outlandish proposal to Lawrence involving penises. It required a great deal of methodical explanation, which Alan delivered with lots of blushing and stuttering. He was ever so polite, and several times emphasized that he was acutely aware that not everyone in the world was interested in this sort of thing. Lawrence decided that he was probably one of those people. Alan seemed vastly impressed that Lawrence had paused to think about it at all and apologized for putting him out. They went directly back to a discussion of computing machines, and their friendship continued unchanged. But on their next bicycle ride, an overnight camping trip to the Pine Barrens, they were joined by a new fellow, a German named Rudy von something or other. Alan and Rudy's relationship seemed closer, or at least more multi-layered than Alan and Lawrence's. Lawrence concluded that Alan's penis scheme must have finally found a taker. It got Lawrence to thinking. From an evolution standpoint, what was the point of having people around who were not inclined to have offspring? There must be some good and fairly subtle reason for it. The only thing he could work out was that it was groups of people, societies, rather than individual creatures who were now trying to out-reproduce and or kill each other, and that, in a society, there was plenty of room for someone who didn't have kids as long as he was up to something useful. Alan and Rudy and Lawrence rode south, anyway, looking for the Pine Barrens. After a while, the towns became very far apart, and the horse farms gave way to a low stubble of feebly spiny trees that appeared to extend all the way to Florida, blocking their view, but not the headwind. "'Where are the Pine Barrens, I wonder?' Lawrence asked a couple of times. He even stopped at a gas station to ask someone that question. His companions began to make fun of him. Where are the pine barrens? Rudy inquired, looking about quizzically. I should look for something rather barren-looking, with numerous pine trees, Alan mused. There was no other traffic, and so they had spread out across the road to pedal three abreast, with Alan in the middle. A forest, as Kafka would imagine it, Rudy muttered. By this point, Lawrence had figured out that they were, in fact, in the Pine Barrens. But he didn't know who Kafka was. A mathematician, he guessed. Oh, that is a scary thing to think of, Rudy said. He is a writer, Alan said. Lawrence, please don't be offended that I ask you this, but do you recognize any other people's names at all? Other than family and close friends, I mean. Lawrence must have looked baffled. I'm trying to figure out whether it all comes from in here, Alan said, reaching out to wrap his knuckles on the side of Lawrence's head. Or do you sometimes take in new ideas from other human beings? When I was a little boy, I saw angels in a church in Virginia, Lawrence said. But I think that they came from inside my head. Very well, Alan said. But later, Alan had another go at it. They had reached the fire lookout tower, and it had been a thunderous disappointment. Just an alienated staircase leading nowhere, and a 